Welcome back to the discussion of spatial computing. Today we are going to meet with Professor Vipin Kumar, uh, who is a William Norris Chair Professor in the Computer Science Department at University of Minnesota. He also heads the department. And in addition, he's one of the most cited authors in computer science, having made contributions in many areas of computer science. So we are going to get a very unique perspective today. So, uh, so let's welcome Professor Vipin Kumar. And hello, Vipin. Thank you hello. for coming. Hello, Shashi. Thank you. Right. I'm happy to be here. So Vipin, you have worked in many areas of computer science. Uh, your thesis starts with artificial intelligence, search algorithms, and constraint programming. And then after coming to Minnesota, you started looking at high performance computing with a very popular software, Matisse, for graph partitioning and a textbook. And then you came to data mining, and again, a lot of contributions, including a textbook. So how did you get started with spatial computing? So I was, as you said, I was working in the area of high performance computing and data mining and its application uh, and how to analyze large data sets using uh, powerful computers. And I was giving a tutorial. Uh, at the uh, supercomputing conference, which is which, gather, which, which is a gathering of uh, of the uh, people working in the area of high performance computing, and at this tutorial, uh, which was titled "Scalable Analytics" uh, in 1999, I had somebody in the audience from NASA who came up to me during the break and he said, "We have a lot of data uh, at NASA. Uh, could we use some of your techniques to analyze these data sets?" And that started the collaboration and a journey that uh, uh, we have been sort of uh, very happy to work on. Wonderful. So what kind of projects are you working on nowadays? Uh, one of my major projects is about looking at the uh, changes um, that are happening in the Earth's ecosystem and uh, the influence uh, on these changes of human activity as well as changing climate. And as you know, the, the Earth has sort of gone through tremendous uh, population growth over the last, uh, few hundred, last few thousand years and few hundred years. And the Earth's surface has changed dramatically to the extent that scientists are calling the last 10,000 years to be Anthropocene. This is the age of the human. Uh, and, and, and many of these changes are because of, of course, population growth. Uh, many of them are because of the rapid industrialization we have experienced. Uh, and the increased demand for food for the, the population that is not only becoming larger, but also more, uh, more wealthy or more uh, prosperous. Uh, and a lot of these changes are placing demand uh, and stresses on the environment. Uh, so the question is, what are these changes? Uh, what are the changes because of the human activity? What are these changes because of the changing climate? How are the human activities impacting the changing climate? And how, uh, how, what can we learn about these interactions to uh, inform policies uh, going forward uh, to manage our Earth system and, and, and figure out how to adapt uh, to this changing climate. So traditionally, uh, people use land surveying, right? Even George Washington was a land surveyor, and so they will go out and take notes or maybe make measurements. So how does spatial computing come in, in this space? How does that help us document the changes? And That's a wonderful uh, example because uh, much of these uh, analyses about how the Earth is changing and how people are interacting with it, uh, in the past has been done through these manual surveys that are very localized. And, and, but that doesn't allow for you to have a good understanding of what's happening on a global scale. Uh, for the last uh, 40 years, for about four decades or so, we have uh, much better quality data about the entire globe uh, from these Earth observing satellites which give you the wall-to-wall -wall coverage uh, of, of the globe uh, uh, from many, many different perspectives. And, 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 and there are many, many different satellites who study the Earth from many different perspectives. And ability to analyze this spatial data, which of course occurs in time, uh, gives us tremendous opportunity to scale up the kind of surveys that were done uh, by people like George Washington many hundred years ago, and do them much more effectively and provide a much more complete uh, understanding of these changes. Yeah, wonderful. So could you maybe illustrate these? I mean, are there some remote sensing uh, data sets you have analyzed and found patterns in the global landscape? Yes, certainly. Let me give you an example of some of the work that we are doing in spatial computing uh, under projects funded by NASA uh, from National Science Foundation under a program called Expedition in Computing and uh, by a nonprofit uh, organization called Planet Risk Institute. In this project, we are analyzing the data sets uh, from remote sensing satellites about the, the Earth 
and looking at the changes, uh, understanding the changes uh, that are happening uh, in the global ecosystem. So here is an example that you see on the screen of uh, locations being identified as the ones that have burned, uh, uh, that, have, sort of, that have been result of forest fires. And, and, the, uh, the, and, and the location here that, that's sort of being mapped spatially by a collection of red points, where each red point represents a square kilometer uh, of forest, uh, is shown here uh, as being mapped as, as, as a fire uh, activity by our algorithms. And you can see a very large area here uh, was burned and you can see a picture of the fire burning uh, in, in the insert over here. And you can see many other fires being mapped as being burned in different locations at different times. And this sort of shows you the power of uh, the spatial uh, data mining algorithms that can analyze these data sets and identify these fires, look at their histories, look at how frequent uh, they are, uh, uh, and how the frequency has been changing, and what may be the result of a human activity around these locations. As another example, I'm going to show you um, uh, an instance of uh, pine uh, beetle infestations uh, in, in Colorado. As some of you may know, uh, the, the pine beetle forest in the, in the entire western half of the United States have gone through a major damage because of the, uh, the, the pine beetles that have sort of uh, damaged these trees. And, and you can see here uh, in the picture uh, on the screen, uh, screenshots, the videos, the photographs, in which you can see these uh, brown patches uh, on the mountains. And you can see up close, uh, these trees have very different color. And using the algorithm, spatial algorithms, as you can see that these dots, each of them represent a square kilometer. Uh, we can map uh, what these changes are and where they're happening. And these changes are happening uh, in response to very small change in the coldest temperature. The coldest temperature over the last a few decades have gone up by a couple of degrees and a couple of degrees centigrade, and that alone has allowed the beetles to be able to live, uh, uh, survive through the winter cycle now farther up north, and that's causing uh, many of these infestations to to, to grow. Uh, and, and here you can sort of see the interplay between the climate and and the ecosystems. That even a very small change in the climate can can cause such a major impact on the ecosystems. As a completely different example of uh, the kind of changes uh, from fires and insect damage, I want to bring your attention to the, the changes that could be happening in the, in the agriculture domain uh, that can be picked up by spatial uh, analysis of data. So you see here uh, round circles um, uh, um, in, in a location in, in Zambia, and you see these round circles being detected as the locations of change and it turns out that these are the locations where a, a large corporation has uh, basically built industrial scale farming uh, uh, that you see here. So this area used to be more like uh, uh, undeveloped um, grassland and, 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 and bushes. And then you can see once this, this company came in, they were able to build these very large scale farmings uh, in which uh, uh, high food production can happen. So this, is, this again is a kind of change uh, that, that you can detect by analyzing the satellite data. As a second example of the changes in agriculture, uh, I'm going to take you to an entirely opposite uh, scenario in which we went from uh, high industrial scale farming to uh, perhaps a poor quality farming. And you see on the screen, you see uh, uh, the agriculture changes in, Z in Zimbabwe, uh, which, uh, which basically went through a major uh, change in the agricultural practices in the early uh, 2000. Uh, basically, the land um, uh, they, they went through a process of land reform or, 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 or sort of land grab in which the, the farmers which were farming the large scale farms uh, were forced to quit their farms and their farms were taken over by small scale farmer and What you can see here on the screen uh, is uh, you can see the locations identified by these algorithms. you can also see the time series data on vegetation uh, changing over the last uh, 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 10 years or so, and you can identify uh, the years in which uh, the, 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 uh, from these vegetation uh, cycles as to when somebody was able to plant two uh, farm cycles in a year, and the year when they were forced to quit, they had to, the, the land was able to produce only one farming cycle, or it became a, a, a uh, barren land afterwards. So you can see examples like these uh, uh, in the entire uh, country of uh, Zimbabwe, and you can map all of the locations where the land grab caused the tremendous 
reduction in agriculture uh, production in, in that country. As the last example of interplay between uh, uh, policies and the, and the impact on the environment, I'd like you to, take to, I'd like you to uh, uh, look at this example from Indonesia. So back uh, about 15 years ago, um, there was a lot of focus on reducing reliance on non-renewable uh, fossil uh, fuel and taking them to biofuels that are renewable. And uh, this started a trend in Indonesia of uh, starting these plantations, palm oil plantations. And this required uh, them to cut uh, rainforest, uh, the tropical rainforest, and instead uh, plant uh, tropical plantations. And you can see the examples of these plantations uh, found uh, on the algorithm, by our algorithms on the screen. You can see the, uh, on the screenshot, you can see here, uh, the palm oil plantation being built and the, the, the red dots that you see in the background are showing you the location identified by the algorithms. And you can basically see the, the silhouette uh, from the background as to that they're covering the, the area very, very well. Now what happened as a result of these changes uh, is that uh, the, the expected savings uh, for carbon from the palm oil reduction turned out to be much, much smaller than the loss of carbon that resulted from these vast uh, reserves of, of tropical rainforest. And later on, it became very clear that this actually was a very bad policy. So being able to figure out what is the impact on the environment of uh, uh, these policies, it's really important for us to figure out how much of this area has been converted and going forward, uh, putting in place the te technologies for monitoring and verification so that this, these things don't happen uh, going forward. So spatial computing can play a very major role here. So looking ahead, next five to 10 years, uh, where do you see spatial computing going? What are the new challenges and opportunities? If you look at the, all the major problems facing the society, food security, water security, energy, uh, they all involve solutions uh, that would require big role being played by the spatial computing. Because most of these problems involve data uh, that are spatial in nature, you know, that goes with agriculture, with food, with water, with energy, and being able to understand these data sets and how the interplay, how, what is the interplay between food, water, and energy, uh, you really need to involve spatial computing technologies uh, to be able to answer this. So I, I, I expect spatial computing to play a major role in advancing uh, the major interests of the society as we go forward. But is it just an application of well-known computer science technique? Could you just take your classical data mining technique and run those on spatial data? Will that do the job? Or do you need new computer science here? New computer science here. That's a very good question. And I often tell when I uh, show uh, what we're working on to, to, to the audience, to the students, and I often remind them that here is a problem. If you, if you use standard textbook techniques, how far you can, can take these problems, and, and what you need uh, in addition to go beyond. And I'll give you an example of something we just talked about earlier, uh, um, which was the detection of fires. And, and, and you saw that the, uh, uh, we are able to sort of identify locations of fires on the globe. We're able to identify locations of insect damage uh, on the globe using the analysis. Now, if you try to uh, work on these problems using traditional uh, techniques, you face a number of challenges. These uh, data sets uh, happen to be, the, the events that you're looking for happen to be extremely rare. Uh, to the extent that most locations, thankfully, do not burn all the time. They, they, they burn very rarely. Uh, the other problem is that you do not have ground truth for most of these. Uh, 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 in California, they track fires very carefully. But if you're looking at uh, Siberian uh, uh, forest, there's hardly any ground truth there. So if you want to do a global uh, uh, coverage of what, what these events are, you have to build models that can work in absence of ground truth. They can work with highly skewed data sets. They can take advantage of the spatial nature of the data and the temporal nature of the, uh, of, of the phenomena. And most of the classical uh, techniques that we, we, we discuss in our books and data mining courses do not incorporate for these uh, special needs. So there's a tremendous need for, for novel techniques to be developed in the area of spatial computing. Great, wonderful. So thank you so much, Vipin, for you know, taking the time to come and talk with our audience. And uh, so this was Professor Vipin Kumar, you know, who is one of the leading computer scientists in the world, and in last 10, 15 years has been making many contributions to spatial computing.
So um, we look forward to seeing you again in other videos to meet other prominent members of spatial computing community and University of Minnesota and around the country and the world. Thank you.